If you wish to uh, spell, will you start tilting, please? We'll go to the alphabet A, B, C, D. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, let's see this up G. Will you please rock twice for yes and once for no? Is it G? Rock twice for yes and once for no, please. Is it G, the first letter, please? Once, twice. Okay, next up the second, uh, second letter, please. Start spelling. A, B. Who are you talking to, Mr. Herbert? Uh, well, we don't know, do we? Uh, but uh, but no, you only want uh, one, uh, one of our subconscious minds, one mm. of us. Mm. <laughs> or maybe all of us, I don't know. Mm. Um, anyway, this is not a, a specialist demonstration, it's just scientific. A, this is B, C, D, E, F, G, H. Some strange goings on have been reported from a pub in Wiltshire. And the widely travelled ghost hunter, Mr. Benson Herbert, has come to investigate. We've got a couple of fireplaces here. Are they all right? They couldn't produce any odd sounds, I suppose. Was there much wind these nights, these the days? days? The days? No, it's quite a quiet day. The first day what, we ever What heard time this. of the year? Um, it must have been late summer. Mm hmm. And uh, I, I suppose a, m a mouse. <laughs> A mouse on the piano couldn't um, make no, funny not, not, not footsteps across <laughs> do, the Do you, do you get mice in the place much? In the uh, not, not in the building. We found some in the outhouses, but not in the building. Not actually in the building. Uh -huh. And it's all carefully locked up and you've got no, had no sign of intruders. Well, the first time this happened uh, was on a Thursday morning. Yeah. Liz was at the cash and carry. And uh, I was sitting downstairs doing some work. And I heard these footsteps go across this clubroom floor. I went, came all the way up. Mm -hmm. The communicating door to the uh, bedroom and uh, club room was closed, bolted from the bedroom side. The doors to the outside stairs were also um, closed. I, went, I opened them. I even looked down the stairs in case someone was walking up and down the stairs, but there was nothing at all. <laughs> so there seem to be two kinds of poltergeists. One is... Uh... Uh, associated with a place, a place located poltergeist, near the person, a person located poltergeist, which follows the person around as they move. So uh, the next question is, uh, what about before you came here? Did you, in your previous place, did you ever get any odd? Uh, in, yes. in our previous place, yes. uh, in our own home, yes. uh, my oh. wife maybe will tell you something about this. Yes, could you? We had a bedroom. Well, we had, well, we've still got the house, actually. Well, actually, you know more about it than I do, because somebody mm. died, one of your relations died in that room, but I didn't know this. I, I didn't know it at all. And I never liked that bedroom. I couldn't stand it. And, and my young daughter didn't like it either. She didn't like being alone in the house, and she was 12 years old. I this mean, she was no baby. This lends weight to the theory, Mr. Herbert, that uh, ghosts go with people uh, it, rather than... Yeah. Place, uh, place, it's a person located uh, at house. Uh, due to her own uh, unconscious powers of, uh, of uh, affecting matter around her, making noise or movements. You had a movement, didn't you? Something moved off a bath or something. Uh, yes. This was a funny, again, a funny incident. We were, um, I was laying, putting up some uh, mirror tiles in the bathroom, six of them, and one continued to fall down, kept falling down, kept falling down, kept falling down, and uh, never smashing, just falling down. Uh, one day we were standing there, it had fallen down, and I said, Liz, there must be something causing this. And she said, it's our poltergeist. So I said, uh, well, if there's someone here, show yourself. And just then, from a chair that was standing, I suppose, five, six feet away from us, fell a bath, a bath rack. Uh, no one pushed it, no one jumped or anything like that. It just fell off. I could say it jumped off, but I, I, I'm prepared to say it fell off. How, yeah, she make, how <laughs> could she make that fall off the wall? Well, by what we call psychokinesis, there's, uh, uh, for example, there's a woman in Leningrad, Madame Kulagina, who can move objects by winning them. I've done experiments with her well, this is doing it many times, and uh, she d doesn't realise she's doing it, but uh, presumably somehow she's doing it. This is theory or fact? Well, uh, well there's, there's a lot of uh, data to, uh, to verify this idea. It's not my idea. It's uh, a general consensus of opinion among parapsychologists all over the world uh, uh, agrees with this idea. And so you would call this telekinesis if she's not aware of it, and psychokinesis if she is aware of it. So, now, Mr. Herbert, are you investigating Liz, or are you investigating the pub? Well, uh, I could, of course, um, put her through some psychic tests to see if she has psychic powers, but 
Um, this is not quite the appropriate moment. I haven't got all the apparatus ready just here. Uh, instead, I will probably just investigate in the room as a, as a physical uh, environment. And uh, we have here some sample apparatus, the kind of thing, a small uh, sample of the kind of apparatus I usually use. Uh, for a preliminary investigation, uh, my assistants, uh, Vicky and uh, Rich, uh, helped me with the setting up. Uh, th this is a ne negative iron pistol. Uh, if, um, uh, if Vicky will come here, I'll just demonstrate to If you like to open your mouth, I I'm going to fire negative ions into your mouth, now I'm firing. Now you can close your mouth. Now I turn it away and I slowly release the trigger uh, and the positive ions are harmlessly going in this direction. Now what does that mean? I mean positive ions, negative ions, what are you talking uh, well, about? Well, negatively charged uh, air, which are very good for the human organism and um, make you more alert. For example, there, there's some French airlines that use this kind of thing for their, uh, for their pilots on long distance flights. It keeps them more alert. Uh, I myself find uh, usually uh, without this I could perhaps keep on working or writing an article at 2 a.m. with it, I can go on to about 4 a.m. without any fatigue, you see. And um, so this helps for the spooky atmosphere. Now, while... Uh, Why do you keep referring to a spooky atmosphere? Because it sounds a bit sort we, of stagey. We are, we are trying to incite the poltergeist. There's uh, some kind of poltergeist. You know, it's difficult to get these to happen just when you want them, especially when people interview you with cameras. So, and uh, we don't know what's going to happen, so we try to bring it on, if possible, mm. uh, for the benefit of the cameras. We hope something might happen, but may not, I don't know. And uh, while Vicky is setting that up, um, Reg is uh, fitting up an infrared detector. Uh, this, if it's properly fixed up, can detect the heat of a candle a quarter of a mile away. But uh, we a don't... A quarter of a mile away? Yes, yes. Are you serious? Oh, yes. This kind of thing is used by uh, astronomers for uh, detecting uh, heat from stellar bodies. Uh, many people in haunted houses claim that the, uh, the temperature goes down before something happens, it uh, gets cold, they feel shivery. And uh, we've discovered that it's, it's a real drop in temperature, it's not just imagination. Mm. And the third bit of apparatus is this uh, electrostatic meter, which detects uh, changes in the electrostatic field. Now, if I... Uh, if you put, put it down here, just to clip this on, you, you can erect this any convenient part, say, in a corridor along which a ghost is supposed mm. to be walking. And when I press this, the uh, needle flickers right over, showing this is pistol is working, you'll say. Mm. I'll, I'll now centralise the needle, and um, when I press it, it'll go to the right, and then when I leave go, it'll go the other way, as you see. And slowly come back to normal. And so if that changes for no reason, one, uh, one may assume possibly that there's something odd happening, like a poltergeist. You've travelled all over Europe, Mr. Benson Herbert, with, with this apparatus that here. Uh, well, yes, with more sophisticated apparatus than this, actually. And what uh, do you think Eastern West Europe. What do you think uh, from what, you, what you've seen there? Do you think that house is haunted or do you think it's her? Uh, well, I think there's uh, probably something odd about the house which this uh, lady Liz is triggering off. But we'll have to investigate for a longer period of time, three or four months at San Orcas. I was there for two or three years, for instance. Uh, one would need at least two or three months to be sure of that there's something rather odd happening, you know? Down in Sussex lives another ghost hunter, Mr. Andrew Green. He believes that ghost sightings are telepathic contact with electromagnetic rays caused by emotional events of the past. Andrew, when you go ghost hunting, how, how many times do you find you're on the right track and on the wrong track? Um, well, I should say the majority of times I'm on the wrong track. The people have imagined they've seen ghosts. They're suffering from pure self-deception. Mm. They're suffering from emotional upset or something, and it's just sheer imagination that they've seen. So how do you tell the, the true one from the false one? Purely by an assessment of the witness themselves, their character, their mental state at the time they saw the ghost. So it's your own personal assessment? That's right, yes. From all the research you've done, do you believe in ghosts yourself? Definitely, yes. I, I've met... A large number of people, I suppose several hundred now in the 30 years that I've been playing around with this subject. And are you telling me that there are things that are out there 
that are to be seen, or there's something that the person himself believes is out there to be seen? No, I think that, that they are out, outside the person, that they are there to be seen by certain people under certain conditions at certain times. Um, when I say certain people, I mean anybody, but provided that the wavelength of their mind matches that of the person who created the ghost in the first place, um, then they will see the ghost. In other words, the, the person who comes along afterwards is re-seeing something that somebody else has projected before. That's right, yes, and they're re-seeing it in a, in a telepathic way. So, the point you're making, Andrew, really, is that they are projecting something into, in, into the place. Um, what you've just said contradicts the whole notion that ghosts are anything to do with uh, religious heaven and hell. Quite. I can't see any connection between ghosts and life after death, for example. We've got the situation where 61% of ghosts that are reported in this country are in fact of phantoms of living people, which go bears out this theory that ghosts have got nothing to do with life. Of nothing. living people? Ghosts of living people. What sort of places, uh, what you know, buildings, locations have you found in your researches? Well, here's another uh, misconception. People seem to think that, ghosts, uh, that the haunted houses are very old manor houses and castles and, and ancient ruins. This isn't true. Um, there's an there's a ref oil refinery in Essex. There are bingo halls, there are theatres, there's uh, some synagogue, for example. Um, modern council houses. And... Hello, who are you? Um, are you Mr Green the Ghost Hunter? Yes, I am. You better come in and sit down. See what you can... Squat out. What do you want to know, fellas? Now, if um, Stephen's house was haunted, yes, yeah, St. Oh, no. um, Catherine's cottage. St. Catherine's. I think it used to be haunted at one time by an old woman. Um, there are a lot of village, a lot of villages in the in the country haunted. A lot of places in this particular village that are haunted. You know the youth club. Is it haunted? That's haunted. Um, this one's haunted as well. This house. Mm. Do you what know was what that guy? haunted by? I don't know. I wish I did. And there's a water diviner. You know a water diviner goes around with a hazel twig to find water. No. What, you point it to the ground? That's right. And yes. if it waves, yes. it, there's water underneath. Yes. Well, he came here about three or four weeks ago, three or four months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and he wanted to find water. And I said, did he find bones? So he said, yes, he found bones. Um, mm. So I said, all right, well, Go around the cottage, see if you can find any bones. And he said, well, I want, I've got to have a bone to work on, you see. If I'm thinking of water, um, I'm looking for water. But I'm thinking of bones and I've got to have a bone with me. So I happened to have dug up a, a cat's jawbone in the front garden. I gave this to him. And he went all over the cottage. And I saw this hazel twig vibrate at the very spot there. And he said, you've got a six foot body along there, underneath the floor. And since when, I've had about 27 people come here and walking from this room into the other one and faint on that spot. So it could be what? Well, it could be an animal, of course. Um, you know, it need not necessarily be a human. What where, where, where is this, Andrew? Well, let's, let's have a look, shall we? See how the, well, these lads feel about it. Can you feel anything there? Because that's where it is. And when I was knocking this baking oven down, you see there were two baking ovens, one there and one there. When I knocked this one down, I found that carving knife. And somebody, two or three people have told me that that was a murder weapon that killed somebody there. And the body lies along there. The head's up there and the feet are here. How do you know that? Well, this is what this chappy with the hazel twig told me. Meanwhile, over in Hampstead, lives a man who spent many years patiently trying to photograph a ghost. He's Mr John Cutton, a retired naval commander, a member of the Society for Psychical Research. 
I've always been interested in any phenomena or reported phenomena which uh, defies explanation. What have you learned? Um, it's rather a leading question, uh, what I've learned. I mean... Uh, well, I meant it to be. It, you uh, know, it, what, yes, what is the situation uh, about ghosts? Do you believe in ghosts? Uh, that, again, is a difficult question to answer because if I said, yes, I believe in ghosts, it might imply that I frequently see ghosts, which I do not. On the other hand, if I said I didn't believe in ghosts, it would imply that I think nobody sees ghosts, and that wouldn't be true either. Because now, if you saw a ghost, would you then believe in ghosts? Uh, yes, I would, but I, I would not necessarily assume that it was uh, an external entity. I would want it to stay there if possible and try and investigate it and see what in the fact it really was. It might be a product of my own imagination, it might be an hallucination. And I would want to try and see if I could test this out. And this is what? It's a piece of electronic equipment. I'll explain to you what happened. Look, I plug in here. Uh, now that's, that's plugging in a vibrator. And this is plugging in a wind vane. A wind vane? Yes. Well, now, supposing the... Uh, supposing there is a draft of air. Mm -hmm. Happens. Uh, these are three magnets. Now, that would wake me up if I was asleep. And so would, you'd expect to be uh, waiting in a... You'd be sleeping. Well, you'd I'd be, be sleeping. You'd uh, be because on this, on these a, things happen in the middle of the night, you see. Yeah. Now, uh, aut automatically, as that happened, that camera would have operated and mm -hmm. taken a photograph. Mm -hmm. you, you focus that somewhere in the centre of the room. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that buzzer, I'd press this and take a an ordinary flash picture there, you see. Yeah. Hoping that we would get a photograph of something. Now, in addition to that, if there's, if there's a vibration, mm. if that vibrates, mm. the, same thing, the same thing happens. Uh, this is a photoelectric cell. Mm. Uh, if there's a change in the illumination, this can be set by this. So that it's just not operating with mm. the ambient light, and if the light changes, it operates. This is a microphone, the same thing happens. That can be set so that it'll operate with any particular noise. Mm. And here is a, a wire, which I trained all around the room, mm. so that if anything was to touch it physically, <coughs> anything touching that wire. And this one is a temperature control. If the temperature changed within three degrees, <coughs> that would act a uh, thermostatic control, mm. a sensitive one. So it would automatically take a photograph. Uh, hopefully that it would take a photograph of a ghost, mm. but in my view, more likely to take a photograph of a cat knocking something over in the middle of the night and creating a noise. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Because um, whether or not ghosts are external entities, experience has shown that whatever they may be, they don't usually manifest when you set up instruments to detect them. Now you say they don't usually have they ever? To my knowledge, no. No, to my knowledge, no. Mm. Mm. I, I ought to say I have never myself seen a ghost. Mm. So what conclusion do you draw from that? <sighs> well, my own conclusion, I wouldn't want to be t too dogmatic about it, is that uh, these people that do see these uh, manifestations, that it's likely to be a projection from their own mind. This is a, a realm for psychiatrists and psychologists rather than Photographic. Uh, the, uh, oh approach. yes, this, this is my view. Yes, you see it's the, the individual. Uh, personally, the only thing that I would hope for from an instrument of this kind is that it would detect something. In Bath lives Mrs. Royal and her husband. Mrs. Royal is an expert on the city's haunted places. She loves ghosts and prefers to be called a ghost collector. Ken. Ken, come and tell them about the uh, thing you saw the other night. What? Well, there's only a bloke standing up. <laughs> you saw a man standing uh, in your own house? In my bedroom, near yeah, the bed. Sometimes I see a man, sometimes I see a woman, girl. What are they dressed like? And the bloke was dressed in black. Very smart. Now, if I had, a, if I came to a house, if I saw a man in my bedroom. I would, I would get up and challenge him and say, what the hell are you doing here? Well, you're sort of half asleep. You don't, you know, think, well, he's there. He doesn't move and he doesn't menace you at all. So you think, well, why worry? So what do you think it is? No idea. 
I used to think it was the shadows of things, you know, but it's not because uh, you only get it sometimes. I'm always exactly the same, curtains drawn exactly the same. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. For how long do you see him? Until I stop looking at him and go to sleep. You mean you just lie there with a chap standing in the room and you go to sleep? Yes. <laughs> I tell you, it doesn't worry him at all. Well, it's, a bit, it's a bit much, isn't it, to have that in your house at night, I would have thought. Well, um, it certainly doesn't seem to bother him, but I can't say that I would really like it. Uh, I'm glad it sort of haunts him around me, I, you know. Did you say you'd seen somebody else as well? Uh, in, in this house? No, not really, only this... Sometimes this bloke, sometimes a woman up there, girl. A girl? Yeah, yes. A woman big, or a big, girl? Girl, girl, really. What does she look She like? just stands there, sort of turns her head a bit. Well, she's very nice. How old? The 25. Does she talk? No. No, I say, I, if they talk, I'd be happier. Why? I'd have a talk with them if I'd find out something. Have you tried to talk to them? No, no. Well, I mean, if you don't try, you... you... No. But I used to see them, I've seen one, when I was on the buses, I occasionally saw them, you know, I'd see somebody waiting in a bus stop for me, and I'd pull up. You were a bus driver, weren't yes, you? Yes, yeah. I'd pull up, you see. Nobody there. Well, everybody think, what are you stopping for? You know, they used to be a bit of a fool. That happened about three or four times in the 28 years. Does it strike you as strange that you see ghosts? Well, I don't know. It's, I suppose it is, really. I think I'm... I don't know what I see. I mean, I don't know whether they're there or it's my imagination. Well, what do you think? I think I've got an open mind. Well, I mean, you can't have an open mind if you see a man standing in the bedroom. <laughs> well, you can, and he won't speak to you. <laughs> but I'm quite sure if I got out of bed, he'd just disappear. Now, Mrs. Roy, your husband sees a man standing in the room, and he has an open mind about ghosts. Now, uh. this is crazy to me, but what do you think? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, he thinks it's a word. Just one of those things. You can't have, you can't say it's just one of those things to have a black figure standing in the bedroom. Oh, well, I believe in ghosts. I don't know what they are, but I believe in them. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, if he's got an open mind about it and he doesn't, he's not worried by a chap standing in the bedroom, well, it's all right. So off we went with Mrs. Royal and a party of enthusiasts on a conducted ghost tour. Mrs. Royal, incidentally, is inclined to believe, like Mr. Green, that ghosts are electromagnetic projections on some sort of time screen that most people can't see. Bunty has been here, I don't know how many years, but we've sensed her ever since we've been here, 11 years. I can imagine she must have been a servant in the days when this was a coaching inn. She is no bigger than five foot, she's a dear little lady. She's got a feather duster cap like the old-fashioned servants used to wear. Short grey curly hair. She wears a long grey frock right to her ankles. A white pinny with a bib and tied round the waist like the servants used to wear. And little tiny black patent shoes. And that's all I can tell you about Bunty. She's perfectly harmless. She's mischievous. She lifts lids off dustbins. She lifts lids off laundry bins. She takes the lids off saucepans to peep what's in there. But apart from that, she does no harm at all. Do you mean that you've seen the lids coming off the saucepan? Yes, oh yes. And the dustbin? Ah, yeah. And the laundry bin. And it can't come off with the wind or anything because it's a screw top. It's clipped in. Oh yes, she peeps in to see what's happening. Who was the first person to see her? I was. Did you tell the other people about Yeah, that? and they might have been laughed at me for years. Can you get him? Bernard! Excuse me! Bernard! <laughs> you've definitely seen Bunty, haven't you? Oh, yes. Yes, I have. On the night of the thunderstorm. Yeah. On what? On the night of the thunderstorm. What did you see? Well, as I came down, I thought the dog was whining and that, you see. I came down to look for the dog, and as I came down over the stairs, she was in the corner of the stairs, and there's a bend on the stairs. And as I came down, I could see her as plain as day. And I came down over the steps, she vanished. Then as she went round, turned the, the corner of the stairs. I actually seen it. This is Bennett Street. Now, this is famous for a ghost that's been seen over a number of years. He's usually described as uh, looking like, a little like Sandeman's Port. 
with a big hat and a mm -hmm. black cloak. You yes. Mean? Uh, the, the descriptions ver uh, vary a little, but this is uh, not very much, not basically. He usually, I understand, appears between the hours of about 5 and 10 p.m., so he goes to bed early, or something of that sort. Now, this is Saville Row, and he has been seen by several people along there, including uh, Miss Montefiore here. I was coming down here yes. one evening at about a quarter to nine mm -hmm. to go th straight through to get a bus up to my, see my mother. Yes. And as I got to about this spot, I, around here, I saw a little man in a long dark cloak with a large black hat. And he was looking down. As he came up, we, we met at about this point. I got an, uh, an impression of extreme melancholy as he passed me. Uh, my first impression was that he was in fancy dress and probably had come from the Theatre Royal. When he got to me here, I turned round in order to have another look and there was nowhere to be seen. So I went back and I looked in every single doorway and he was, I couldn't see a trace of this figure. A little grey phantom lady flits around Bath Theatre Royal. A property clock without any works is said to have chimed here during a production. And Mr Frank Maddox, the manager, has an even stranger story to tell. In uh, August 1948, unfortunately my father was struck down and he died suddenly and I had to take over here. And in looking through his papers to find out what he had been planning for the forthcoming pantomime, I found um, that there was a butterfly ballet which had been uh, in his mind to end the first half of the pantomime. Uh, so I put this into the pantomime and uh, that was 27 years ago. And every year, without exception, except rather, I'm sorry, with one exception, 1962-3, a Red Admiral butterfly always appears on the stage either during rehearsals or during the pantomime season. Now, this is in December and January and February. Yes. And it's a rather unusual time. Oh, and there's only one. A and single, it happened a again. A single butterfly appears yes. in the theatre. That's correct. One single. Yeah. Yeah. Now, a lot of people didn't believe me. They thought it was a publicity stunt. Yeah. But after some years, I opened my office door one year and the butterfly flew in. So I closed the door rather quickly <laughs> and rang up the press. And the press were kind enough to send along a photographer and they photographed it. And I have the photographs here. There are the photographs, as you can see, mm. the butterfly on my hand, on my shirt, well, on my collar. A red admiral in December. No, it's not a red admiral. It's not. It's this a isn't. tortoise shell. Uh-huh. But uh, Oh there and it is. And it's always again. a tortoise shell. It's always one one tortoise shell. We never <laughs> see more. <laughs> it's extremely tame. Uh, <laughs> Very friendly. Well it was getting a bit sleepy that uh, on that occasion. That's lovely. Mr. Yes, we would like to see that. Yes, first. I'll pass them round. There you are. Thank you. Well, you've got. But a... that's not a ghost because it's a real butterfly. Uh, but it might be a spirit of someone. Uh, probably my father, I should think. I should just like to suggest to Mr. Maddox that he does not make any inquiries into the appearance of the butterfly. Not, not to do what? Not to make any inquiries about the butterfly which appears here, because I have known cases where inquiries have been made about pleasant happenings that are. Are possibly supernatural, and then the uh, whole thing has just faded and nothing happens anymore. I don't suggest it will happen in this case, but I wouldn't very much like you not to, not to make any inquiries, just to accept the appearance. Now, we're up in Yorkshire, which is famous for its ghosts and its hauntings. And you, Mr. Griffiths, saw the... The Rector of Bolton Abbey. The Rector of Bolton yes. Abbey. Yes. Which is itself haunting. I don't like that word haunting because it conjures up the thoughts of something evil and something that's not right. I would prefer to say that we are visited by the spirit here. And it's the spirit of an Augustinian priest. Here? At the, yes, at the... at the Priory. He's been seen in church. He's been seen in the environs. He's been seen in the choir. Have you seen him? Yes, and he's been seen in the house. And uh, the difference is that 
A spirit can and does block out light, whereas a ghost is nebulous. And another thing is that a spirit appears only in the close of its time. Consequently, we see the Augustinian priest in the uh, forerunner of our cassock with a white overlay and a flat black hat, which we now know as the Bishop Andrew cap. You never had the experience of uh, suddenly feeling that you are being watched or somebody's by your side. Well, that's a personal feeling, which yes. may not mean anything. But in all probability, it's a spirit emanation. Why do you say that? Because I firmly believe that the spirits of the departed are our guardian angels. Mm. After all, the thought of angels with the white wings, the white robes and the halo is really only from uh, the medieval times trying to describe the heavenly beings. But why should angels be so distinctive? Why well, I don't know. You tell me, because that's what uh, I can well, see. That's you a for. rhetorical question. Yes, yes. I'm putting it rhetorically. Why shouldn't they be the spirits of the departed? After all, in most churches, we do have the commendation, may the souls of the faith of the departed rest in peace. But again, I firmly believe this, that what we've not done completed on this earth we can be called upon to do and complete the work later on. This dates back to when, this man? Well, the Priory was f founded in 1150, here. Now, doesn't it surprise you to see somebody from 1150 wandering around the grounds of an old Priory like this? Why? Why shouldn't they be here carrying on more work that they pos possibly didn't finish or that um, there's new work to be done? So, a, re a figure from 1150 doesn't surprise you, Mr. Griffiths. It surprises me very much. I don't see why it should surprise you, because it seems quite natural to me that, um, as I was mentioning just now, that if he be one of the guardian angels, why shouldn't he be here? Why shouldn't he make himself seen? He walks down this path quite often. Nobody's spoken to him? Not that I know of. And I've never been close enough to speak, although I have been told that the way to address them is in the name of God, can I help you? But uh, we get other psychic phenomena. Uh, we get the smell of incense. I had quite a shock not a few Sundays ago. I just finished consecrating at the communion service. And as I genuflected after the uh, consecration, there was a waft of incense went right across the altar. Now, incense has not been used in that church for the past, since before 1539. And I certainly wouldn't dare use it. Which presents another problem, a ghostly smell. Well, I suppose it does, really, but it's in given terms. to some than, than to others. You believe that ghosts or spirits, spirits or please. whatever one sees yes. are, in fact, heavenly bodies which are, uh, make themselves available to human beings from time to time. Yes, that is what I've, I've been trying to put over, possibly, and you've put it in uh, more cogent words than I could have done so. Now, the complication with this is that they've got clothes on. Well, why shouldn't they have? Because, because you wouldn't expect people in heaven to have clothes on. Where does it say that they don't wear clothes? It doesn't. It doesn't, it's no. It's a problem. Well, they've got to identify themselves in some way or other. I suppose the fact is that they'd be in the clothes that they were used to wearing, and so they identify themselves in that way. So in a, in a strange, mystical way, the clothes are spiritually creating themselves as well as the people. Well, there are two things which are closest to us in this life, which are very close to us. One is our watch, and the other is our clothes. And you can identify a person by their clothes more often than not. And so they, a priest would be identified with his uh, special habit. And so I think the way that they identify themselves to us is to be... A, in their own clothes. Now, where do you draw all your feelings about this from? Is it the teaching of the church? Is it the general culture of the church, of Christianity? The general culture, I suppose. But I have my own personal feelings, which I couldn't explain. But this is Britain's most remarkable haunted place, on the borders of Essex and Suffolk. In 1863, a rectory was built here, and just about every strange phenomena have been reported over the years. So, Peter Underwood, you are president of the Ghost Club in England, which makes you one of the leading ghost hunters. 
And here we are at Borley Rectory, one of the most haunted houses in the country. Is that right? Well, yes, but uh, we're not actually at, at Borley Rectory because Borley Rectory stood over there and is no longer there. But the, I'm quite convinced, beyond any shadow of doubt, that the house that stood just across the road was and fully lived up to its name as the most haunted house in England. Why? Why are you convinced? The accumulation of evidence over the years is absolutely shattering. It all began with the legend, and of course the most familiar aspect of the haunting is a ghost nun, which has been seen for something like, well, nearly a hundred years. One of the rectors even bricked up one of the windows because he said the phantom nun looked in at him having his breakfast. But over the years, phantom figures have been seen, footsteps have been heard, solid heavy footsteps on floorboards, messages have been scribbled on the walls and on pieces of paper, apparently from a French nun asking for light, mass and prayers. Bones have been found, two skulls have been found, one was buried in the churchyard, the other... Were they identified as women or female? Or? One of them was identified as a young female and it's rather interesting because a dental surgeon discovered that there was a deep-seated abscess in the jawbone and nearly all the people who have reported seeing the nun have said that she appeared sad-faced, unhappy. And of course with a deep-seated abscess she would indeed. So really we're sad. talking about a, 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 the ghosts of a, a nun with toothache? That's what it sounds like, yes, yes. But putting all that on one side, the fact remains you've got the incumbences of four rectors from 1892, uh, from 1863 rather, until 1935, four rectors, their families, wives, many friends and relatives, all of whom assert that they heard, saw and felt things which they can't explain. And I think the accumulated evidence is absolutely overwhelming that this was indeed the most haunted house in England. It was 1937 that when the Smiths were here, uh, Smith had recently come to England from in India and he just walked into this and he wondered what was happening. He saw a figure, he saw a phantom coach, his lights suddenly blared up, bells rang. He didn't know what to do and he wrote to a, the national paper and they sent down Harry Price, who was the leading psychic investigator at that time. And of course he was fascinated once he heard the story and started making inquiries. Uh, the ecclesiastical authorities decided that the house was no longer suitable for a rector to live in and Price decided to rent it and he rented the place for a year arranged independent investigators who again reported identical phenomena, footsteps, lights, noises, bell ringing, and so on. Uh, and then the place was sold privately to a Cracton Grigson, and while he owned it, a somewhat mysterious fire took place and the place was gutted. But the interesting thing is that once the rectory was destroyed and there was no building on the site, then the entities apparently transferred their activities to the church where visiting rectors have seen figures, have heard noises. Many visitors have reported footsteps following them up the church path inside the uh, church itself. At Epping, working on the M11 motorway extension, is one of Borley's most remarkable witnesses. Mr. Croom Hollingsworth and a team of investigators taped recordings in the church and spent many nights observing the rectory grounds. I got a team together with Roy Potter and we did the uh, Actually, uh, on the site of the rectory, we concentrated mostly. Have and you we've... seen anything there? Oh, yes. Uh, um, in June, I can't even mention the exact date, but in June, we sighted the nun. You did? Oh, yes, uh, two of us. What time of the day? Uh, oh, I would say somewhere about quarter to two in the morning it was. It was absolutely full moon. And uh, first of all, we couldn't, uh, you know, we couldn't really... <laughs> we were astonished. But when we saw this apparition, um, go through bushes and through railings and across a, a, a trench, we knew we were really onto something. So we had an observation actually 11 minutes and I had a How long? 11 minutes. You 11 watched minutes. a ghost for 11 minutes? 11 minutes, exactly. Well, I wouldn't say exactly, but around about 11 minutes, nine to 11 minutes. Now, this, uh, I had a wonderful view of her because uh, she came towards me and then she stood still for some time and I was able to have a good look at the nun. Uh, she actually started on the original old nun's walk, which is in the back garden of some people's bungalow. And uh, she disappeared in the, the back part of their bungalow, and then she reappeared and came across into the rectory part. Actually, she finished up behind the rectory and disappeared in, the, in some shrubs there. 
the nun, or um, when she's looking at you, she's not seeing you at all. She's not seeing you. Even when she was supposed to stand in the old days of Harry Price, stand looking in the rectory window, she's not seeing the rectory. She is in her own period. She is seeing something that's there in her period. And that's why she appeared about a foot from the ground, which I... She wasn't on the ground? Well, she was a foot above it. Now, this was due, I'm sure, to the original level. Uh, since then, the ground has sunk. So I would say she was at the original level in, the, in her period. It's a weird experience she telling me about. Oh, a well... A woman gliding along a foot above the ground for ten minutes. Well, it, it may seem absurd to you, but I'm going by what I saw. And uh, this, of course, has been substantiated by, uh, by my chief investigator, who is a very hard headed person, doesn't believe in this type of thing. In fact, so he re reaction was to throw a brick. Throw which, a brick? Uh, yes, at her? Uh, yes, and it went right through, actually. That's a uh, thing to do. Well, no, I think it was a good thing to do because <laughs> it actually totally proved that, uh, that, that, that it was nothing fake. But actually, I got in contact with a chap called David Ellis, who was at Cambridge University studying a scholarship in psychic research. And Ellis was that, uh, you know, he was so surprised what we were getting at Borley and uh, so thrilled. He said, well, now, uh, look, have you tried the church? Why not try and do some tape work in that church? And then we concentrated in the church and we got another person, Denny Denshin, because he was very interested in Borley and he wanted to see for himself if there was anything at Borley. And he came and he got some amazing results. So we'll go in and listen to those recordings. And a warning, do not adjust your television picture. Now, my tape recorder is down by the tomb. What, what f um, family is this? This is the tomb of the Watergrave family who were associated with the area for many years. And there's a possibility that one of this family uh, is the origin of the figure who's been described as a ghost nun. How can, how can a Watergrave be a... Uh, well, the figure has been described as having a veiled headdress, and uh, it's not certain that she's a nun. Also, this um, tomb has been the scene of a number of inexplicable incidents. Uh, people have heard the sound of earth falling, of raps and taps, and even there are some reports of some of the pillars a bit moving. I'm not mm. too happy about that. Well, maybe this is what we have on this tape. Uh, no, I'll play it to you now, and we'll see if um, Tomb Hollingworth got anything like you're talking about. Our investigation was to be carried out in the church, and we came armed with tape recorders. We left the two recorders running on their own inside the building. Before locking the machines in, we searched the building. This session proved to be the most exciting one, but we firmly believe we recorded the sound of a ghost stepping forward and opening something which sounds like a door. At first, we thought we'd recorded the sound of the chancel door being opened, so we investigated this possibility. But neither of these sounds in any way seems to match the ghostly one. Nothing in the vicinity of the altar that we could find could account for the strange recording. We were so intrigued by these events that we returned to the church the following Saturday and spent the entire night there. Having searched the building once more, we locked the machines in, and already the atmosphere seemed to be changing. Two of the team said they felt they were being watched by somebody. Now follows the most remarkable sound of all, for quite clearly, the centre microphone picked up what obviously is a human sigh. After this, we decided to break the sequence of visits and to try again during summer conditions. We started recording about 1am, and the first tapes revealed the natural ambience of the building and nothing else. But as we entered the church at about a quarter to two, we all felt a change in atmosphere. I had a definite tingle pulsing through my body and a feeling as though a presence were pressing against my back. And yet, there was nothing horrific about it. We felt certain, however, that this run would produce results, and we were right. It's the most surprising sound we've heard to date, and we were able to locate it as originating just in front of the altar rail.
there is anybody in this church who is trying to communicate with us, we'd be grateful if you would try and do something tonight. Perhaps you could give us some indication of how we can help you. At about 20 past three in the morning, we picked up the sound of faint rapping. The team made another random visit at the end of August. A watch was kept throughout the night on the chancel door, and this proved worthwhile, for in the small hours, a glow was observed around the door, as though a phosphorescent aura were emanating. On this occasion, the church produced yet another sound. This ended with a rather more frightening sigh. For the fifth visit, it was decided to keep the church manned with observers throughout the entire night. On previous occasions, we'd obtained the best results by leaving the equipment locked inside on its own, and we wondered whether the human presence might have some adverse effect on conditions. At about ten past four in the morning, three of us kept watch from a choir stall adjacent to the altar. This was to be a memorable and frightening occasion. For most of the period, there were odd clicks and taps generated in the area of the font. But as it was extremely dark, we could see nothing. Then we began to see tiny points of light hovering on the curtain behind the font and on one of the pews about a quarter of the way down the church. At first, we thought we couldn't believe our own eyes, and each one of us thought we were suffering from fatigue until we broke the silence to speak about it. I think I must be getting tired of that. I keep seeing things. Jerry, are you watching Peter? The, the curtain might have been. The first one the curtain. And then the pews, the first few pews. Yes, that's where I'm seeing them. That's why. It lights up the door as well. And it flashes on and off a big storm, you do. Yes, I saw one just then, too. The main one is up in the curtain. Eh? On the right hand side, right in the curtain. Very curious, isn't it? Yeah. Yes, there's one of the pew again then. Yeah. No, you're not seeing things, Peter. The three it's of us good. can see them, so it obviously exists, whatever it is. It's a strange phenomenon. It's stripped this time, isn't it? It's, it's even... Now, that was fantastic. We've no idea what that was. It certainly made all of us jump, as though some object had been thrown down. It's curious that that seemed to have been tied up, but you're getting colder and colder. It's like a build-up of power. After a while, we realised the lights were coming closer to us. But although we stuck our ground, there were no further audible disturbances in the church, and the lights eventually vanished. As to what they mean, it's anybody's guess. But whatever they are, they are physical. The microphones prove that. Would you say that, well, as an expert, that um, these are things that are happening outside that people are observing, or that they're things that they are projecting from their own minds and think they're, they're seeing? Well, there I, I really go back to the, this atmospheric photograph theory. Mm. See, if... We, we don't, just don't know, really, but it may be that all our thoughts, yeah, but what do you all think? our actions, mm. may be recorded on some sort of eternal tape and under certain conditions, maybe climatic conditions, maybe in the presence of certain people, occasionally they reappear. We just don't know. That, that's I your... don't honestly think that the um, figures that are seen represent an afterlife. I think it's much more likely that it's some kind of echo of the previous life. 